Hello, Hi. hello. Hey, Tina, how's it going? How are you? Good. I'm well, I'm well. I hope I got a good enough connection here. I'm at the uh, park in uh, Medford here. I think it's a, yeah, I can hear you just fine. Great, great. Happy season. It sounds like you've been super busy on your farm. Yes, indeed. Definitely have. Yeah, we, uh, we just got a bunch of hemp in the ground, about five acres of hemp. So wow. it's uh, been really, really busy time of year. Uh, we've been working on the drip line, trying to get that in. Fortunately, we were blessed with some rain, some unexpected rain. So mm -hmm. that, that was really a, a blessing and really a, a savior, really, because uh, we're a little bit behind on getting our drip lines in. Um, you know, this is uh, some of the bigger acreage farms that I've worked on. So it's things that would be a small task on a fa smaller farm become a giant task, you know, when you scale it up. Yes. Yeah. So it's new to you to do this acreage and it's also new to you to, to scale up on uh, Korean natural farming, right? There's a small yeah. level, so lots of that. Definitely. Yeah. And so that's, that's what I wanted to talk about today uh, was really the last two years of my trials with KNF and Jadam more, you know, on a larger scale working with commercial cannabis and hemp farms. Perfect. Yeah, because everyone, I think that's like, that's a very prevalent question is how, you know, it's great. This is great and all, but how do you scale up? How do you scale up and right. improve the system? Absolutely. Yeah, it's very, uh, I've learned that it's a very systematic approach. You know, it doesn't make sense to pick dandelions on your, your lawn if you have, you know, several acres to work on. So, so really for me, it, it's come down to only a few herbs that I'm working with on, you know, five acres of, of hemp, um, you know, because I'm very sensitive also to uh, the wild crafting techniques we use, uh, being sustainable with our wild crafting practices, you know, having a reverence for, for the wild places to truly be regenerative. We need to be uh, sustainable and, and careful about the way that we're, we're approaching nature and, and, and harvesting. Absolutely. And so, yeah, definitely we're going to talk about that. And maybe as an intro to people who, who may not know about you, um, I'm fascinated and feel sort of in alignment with you mm. that you've just got a host of different kinds of um, uh, trainings and knowledge going for you. You're an herbalist, you practice alchemy, you are mm. a permaculturist, mm. correct? And then yes. you added Korean natural farming to the, to the mix. So can you just go briefly into yeah. a little bit of your history and what brought you to this place? Sure, yeah. Uh, you know, in a past life, I guess you could say I was an architectural draftsman working at a desk job uh, and did that for over a decade. And in 2009, the economy collapsed. Uh, I found myself out of work and kind of wondering, well, what's next? I, I kind of had the American dream, owned a house, had a nice car, all, all the things, kind of did what I thought I was supposed to do, and it collapsed. And so uh, that set me on a whole new kind of course in life. Um, I was living in Salt Lake City, Utah at the time, so um, I, I bought a sleeping bag and tent with my last paycheck and kind of was hiking around through the foothills and <laughs> uh, camping and learned about, you know, nettle and, and nettles and uh, elderberries and, and found that I could sustain off of, off of these plants alone. Uh, and from there, um, you know, I'll just shorten this story, but I ended up in Japan. I had a Japanese girlfriend at the time, so I moved to Japan. And the first day I got there was the day that the tsunami happened. So, wow. <laughs> yeah, that was my entrance into living in Japan and uh, dealing with a uh, natural disaster and a lot of um, un instability in, in city life. So, so what it really did for me was catalyze um, thinking about like living more sustainably and how in society maybe we're not doing the best job of that. So from Japan, when I went back to the States, I had an opportunity to move to Humboldt County. Uh, my mm -hmm. sister had been living there for like 20 years, her and her partner. And so I went out to Humboldt County from there. I, I had the opportunity to work on uh, many uh, cannabis farms and medical cannabis farms living off the grid. 
Um, a year of that time, I, I spent living in a, in a tent in the Lost Coast, really uh, isolated from um, a lot of civilization and people and, and just kind of got to spend time, uh, you know, communing with the forest and learning about the plants. And um, then I got into some, so really that's what drove me into, you know, permaculture ideals which led me into finding about Korean natural farming. Uh, and so, so, yeah, I owe a lot to, to Humboldt County for, for taking me in and, and really teaching me sustainability and, and regenerative farming. And, and so from there, I was kind of offered work in Southern Oregon for some bigger farms doing this uh, commercially. I was offered a gig uh, a couple of years ago uh, with a company to come out and show them how to do Korean natural farming on a large scale, which was very attractive to me because I had done it on smaller scales, even indoors and, and seen a lot of really great results with it. But yeah. this was this was an opportunity for me to um, to scale this up and, and show that it that it worked on a large scale, uh, which I did. And and um, really you know ever since i found knf i've I've never gone back to right to other styles of, of farming yeah 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 and so you were were you able to find results from that first year of scaling up like right away that first year was it yes yeah definitely so so the farm that i got to uh in oregon it was a uh, two tier two grows so it was about a, it was about two and a half acres uh of cannabis and when i got there you know there's a lot of clay soil in southern oregon um a lot of volcanic pumice and clay and when i got there the soil was horrible it, it was i wouldn't even call it soil really it was uh it was clay it looked like the desert you know cracks in the desert um, very, <laughs> yeah exactly you know very hydrophobic no yes. life in the no life in the soil no worms no 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 topsoil really and so the first thing i did was i came in and i i did a heavy mulch and i did a, a very heavy application of jms jadon microbial solution alternated that with lactic acid bacteria and over the course of uh three months the winter time the wet months uh totally transformed the soil there from being hard clay, hydrophobic, holding no water to really beautiful soil that, you know, was holding water that had life in it, that had worms. So I what mean, was really, the size of that application? Did you, uh, so the mulch layer, did you, was it like, how deep did you go on that, that first year? Uh, not, not too terribly deep. It just did a, a straw layer and, okay. you know, only, only about, uh, half inch of straw, I'd say, across nice. the top. Yeah. Okay. And uh, we were blessed with uh, a lot of rains. And so basically, mm -hmm. uh, I would alternate. One week, I would do JMS, Jadon Microbial Solution. Uh, the next week, I would do Lactic Acid Bacteria. And between the you two of them... You were doing that as a foliar? Foliars? Uh, well, yeah. I mean, I was, I was drenching. I mean, not foliars, drenching. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah, that's all right. Uh, yeah, so I was soil drenching and, yeah. uh, and yeah, it was amazing to me to see how just in three months you could really transform, uh, clay hard, you know, cracked hydrophobic soil into really beautiful, uh, living soil. Yeah. So gorgeous. we did. Yeah. And so we saw a huge transformation in, uh, you know, the, the, the health of the plants, uh, it was really, really amazing. Very cool. All yeah. right. So that, that kind of, so then how did you get into your situation now and what are you, yeah, we can launch into what you're mm. wanting to share. Great, great. What you're doing now. Yeah. So, so I'm, I'm primarily working with, uh, hemp now, but I also grow, um, you know, I'm an herbalist and I, and I grow a lot of perennial herbs, annual herbs and work with a lot of different herbs. So, I have a passion for growing herbs and veggies as well, but primarily uh, I'm, I'm working full time on, on uh, two hemp farms at the moment and consulting on some other hemp farms up in Bend and, and around Oregon. Um, 
so stepping back to, to the story where I came out to Oregon to work for this company, I, I, at one point the company got absorbed by a larger company and I had some ethical dilemmas with, with that and teaching Korean natural farming to these big scale companies. So I was fortunate I left that company and now I'm working with uh, some smaller, uh, my partners um, on some smaller, you know, hemp, hemp projects. So mm-hmm. hemp, hemp is primarily my focus and that's what I'm using the Jadam KNF practices on really right now. Very um, cool. Yeah. So are you finding that the, the up, like scaling up has, okay, mm. how do I ask this? Is it like, is the sweet spot of application applied large scale seem to be in, is there, is there a range between like three to five acres or, you know, does it, where does it change? Where, where, mm. where does it scale up seem to shift from maybe not so sustainable to uh, ideal is have your are you yeah. finding a sweet spot yeah that's a great question well i would say yeah once you get into uh above a couple of acres you know when you're doing five to ten acres things really start to change so uh you know, for me, I can, I can make inputs for the most part to be able to cover that. But what gets tricky is, is finding, say, like, uh, you know, herbs, plants to do fermented plant juices, doing like a totally traditional style Korean natural farming approach. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so I would say, yeah, above that two acreage, once you get up into like, you know, five to ten and, and above that, things really start to change. And it's like, so where do you find enough, um, you know, plant tops to, to make FPJs for that kind of scale? Yeah. Um, and so for me, it's really narrowed down to really only a, a few herbs that I'll work with. And, mm-hmm. and so the thinking that I really use uh, these days, uh, I was really inspired by a uh, workshop I went to with um, – Master Cho and Young Sun Cho uh, Jadam out in Williams, Oregon. They -hmm. came last year. And so this idea of growing your own fertilizer, like Mm -hmm. taking, taking a part of your crop. And so thinking ahead of time and thinking like, okay, I'm actually growing a percentage of my crop for fertilizer. So that's something that really I took to heart last year. And I was so inspired by that idea that, you know, we had four greenhouses that were a hundred by 30 full of hemp. And I convinced my partners, it wasn't easy, but (laughs) I convinced them to chop down a whole greenhouse because we could, we had time to replant and we used uh, all that biomass to make uh, FPJ fermented plant juices and uh, Jadam liquid fertilizers from one quarter of the hemp that we were growing. Wow. Yeah. So I was really inspired by that. And so the theory there being that, you know, if we look at nutrient cycling in nature and how, you know, leaves are defoliating, dropping their leaves and creating a mulch layer, and that is creating a protective zone for all these indigenous microorganisms to thrive and start breaking that down and then nutrient cycling that back to the plant. So, it's really the same idea. Uh, we are using that plant because it is uh, in turn the best analog for that plant. Uh, and I had a moment where I was sitting with, with uh, Master Cho and uh, we were on a, a farm. I'll just call it a tomato farm. Uh, <laughs> so I'm sitting with Master Cho and I asked him, you know, they were growing some dynamic accumulators such as comfrey and some other herbs. And I, I asked him, I said, so Master Cho, would you, in this situation here, would you harvest this comfrey, this great dynamic accumulator to make fertilizer out of, or would you use the plant being grown here? And he said, oh, always use the plant you're growing if, if possible, Mm -hmm. you know, so that makes sense. All the ratios are there. Yeah, exactly. So it, it's a perfect analog for itself. Mm-hmm. That's you know, beautiful. yeah, so I really took that to heart. And so now I put a lot of thought ahead of time as as far as like trying to grow 
my own fertilizer. So before we even have to go out into nature to wildcraft, we can be thinking about, okay, I can grow a certain percentage of my own fertilizers here. Yeah. Yeah. So you, so you said you were able to harvest that in time for a second harp for a second planting. Was yeah. there a t so you must, so they must have been fairly young plants. And then did you take the whole mm. plant or did you just take the tips for the, for the, uh, fermented plant juice and then use the rest as a JLF? Mm. Is, how did you, what was the process for that? Yeah. So we did both actually. Uh, the plants did get to be about, uh, you know, about three feet tall. So we, we planted pretty early in the season and, you know, we still had enough time that we could put in some plants, some starts we had, uh, and still get a good yield off that second round. Um, That's gorgeous. Yeah. So we, we harvested that one full greenhouse of hemp. I did go in and I made um, fermented plant juices with all the growth tips. And then I took the rest of it, including the roots, the whole plant, ch chopped it all down into IBC totes uh, and made a liquid fertilizer, Jadam liquid fertilizer out of the rest of it. So none of that hemp was wasted whatsoever. We used all of it, the roots, everything. Beautiful. Yeah. And then so, were you able to apply that JLF same season or is that something that you would carry? Like, would you carry that into the second mm -hmm. season? Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. So uh, I found, you know, working with different plants, making uh, Jadam liquid fertilizers, you know, certain plants will break down faster. Yeah. And so, you know, hemp and cannabis takes a bit more time. Uh, I did end up using some of it towards towards the end. And this year we're, we're using some of that fertilizer from last year, too. So I gave it I gave it about you know, five weeks to really break down uh, yeah. and then started using that. So, wow. cool. uh, you, you know, different herbs, though, will break down much quicker in a Jadam liquid fertilizer. Plants like uh, this, for instance, purslane here. What is that? Oh, yeah. Purslane? Yeah. So purslane is an all-star. Uh, this is one of the top recommended herbs that master Joe talks about for making fermented plant juices. It's a dynamic accumulator and it also has, um, it also has alkaloids that enhance the color and flavor, um, of, of your crop. So the cool thing about purslane is when you do a liquid fertilizer with purslane, it will break down in liquid in 10 days. So wow. that's pretty awesome. Like you have, this will fully liquefy and turn into a liquid ferment in 10 days time when you put that in water with, you know, a handful of leaf mold and inoculant in there, some IMO. Um, you can break that down into a, a really great fertilizer. Um, another one I'd like to mention. Uh, so these are some of the herbs that, that I am using on a large scale because mm -hmm. they're abundant uh, and they're very nutrient dense. Uh, so another one in that category I'd like to mention is uh, skunk cabbage. Mm. And I found a ton of skunk cabbage here in certain areas. And it also, uh, it, has, it has some great terpenes in it. And, you know, so really what we're looking for, as you all know, Tina, is like we're, we're looking for like those plants that, that are like vigorous growers that kind of dominate the landscape. Uh, those are generally what we, we look for when, when we're making FPJs. And so to me, skunk cabbage is, is a perfect example of an FPJ plant because it's just huge, vigorous, large plant. And so it's, it's basically showing us that it is packed full of growth hormones. Um, so that's really what we're looking for when we're looking for the FPJs and like the purslane in a liquid ferment, that skunk cabbage will break down uh, in less than two weeks. It's completely liquefied, completely micronized, ready to use. Beautiful. Okay. What are you using in ratio? Are you using it? Like, how are you using the JLF? Yeah, good question. So this kind of gets into um, how I'm intermixing um, 
Jadam and Korean Nacho Farming because for me, I found it really hard to make enough FPJs to really do kind of the uh, traditional approach to Korean Nacho Farming. Mm -hmm. So what I'm doing is I'm alternating in Jadam liquid fertilizers in place of fermented plant juices. I still use fermented plant juices, but I'm also alternating in the, uh, the liquid fertilizers. And so, you know, and in Jadam, they kind of give a broad spectrum of application for the liquid fertilizers. Like I was reading this morning, you know, anywhere from 20 to 300 dilution ratio uh, for like per slain. So what I've been doing is I usually do about one to a hundred. Mm. So I'll do that in place of a fermented plant juice. If I don't have a fermented plant juice on hand. Um, are you using it in concert with the OHNs and all that? Or are you using yes. it strictly? Oh, okay. Yeah. So, all right. yeah. so you're subbing it in. Yeah. That's, subbing it in. Cool. Yeah. So, uh, I, I have also done just strictly JLF applications as well. Um, but yeah, lately I've been subbing it in for FPJs when I don't have FPJ on hand. So, um, a few advantages too of the, the liquid fertilizers is that, you know, well, first of all, you don't have to buy a bunch of sugar. And secondly, you know, yes. you can, you don't, you don't have to just use the growth tips, you know, like we do in, um, fermented plant juices you can really use a whole plant uh i will actually do different blends for different uh stages of the plant growth so i have like a, a flowering blend that i'll use um and so that one uh i i'll just tell you what i i use what's showing up for me here in southern oregon um so i'll do a, a jadam liquid fertilizer uh and this is uh what I would do for say a flowering uh, ferment here. Mm -hmm. um, so wild carrot, Queen Anne's lace, this is in flower right now. Um, really has some nice volatile uh, compounds going on. Um, also teasel, teasel shows up everywhere. Really vigorous grower. Been using a lot of teasel in my liquid ferments. Um, chicory, chicory was brought here from <laughs> Europe uh as a cattle feed it's really it's a great dynamic accumulator high in a lot of elements and minerals um really love to to use chicory in in liquid ferments as well and let's see um yeah so that's generally what what kind of shows up in and around the farm that mm -hmm. i'm sourcing that's that's abundant you know so i'm not going out you know taking say i have like a hedge of nettle in, in the corner of my my farm i'm not going there and totally you know desecrating that whole stand so that it's not going to grow back next year i'm really looking for um well i should mention blackberry too you mm -hmm. know blackberry is is one of the invasives that really shows up um in the pacific northwest and in many other places uh there's no shortage of it and it's it's packed full of growth hormones, enzymes, all that good stuff. So, let's see. Um, are you are you harvesting it through its cycle, like getting its 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 new growth, and then and then later, like, are you doing different stages of um, mm. harvesting? Yes. Plant yeah, definitely. So, with blackberry, for instance, I'll uh, do an initial harvest when. <clears throat> you know, early spring when you're just seeing those new growth tips coming off the plant. Yeah. I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll harvest that for a vegetative uh, FPJ. And then I'll wait for the blackberry to go into to bud when it gets those nice white buds. We, we're just kind of past that stage here in Southern Oregon and it's um, they went to flower now. But that mm -hmm. bu that budding stage, the budding like and right at that like right that that bigger is like just ready to pop kind of thing. Is that yeah, what yeah, at? exactly. Yeah, so yeah. I would harvest at that stage for that transitional stage. You know, when nice. when our plants, yeah. So when our plants are transitioning from vegetative to now flower, they're going yeah. through that process, and so that's when I would harvest the blackberry buds. 
to, uh, to give some of those transitional hormones and enzymes and, and all that stuff. So then the final stage of the blackberry would be harvesting the fruit, which yeah. you could use in a fermented fruit juice for, you know, the later stages of plant growth. Now, are you, so, so when are, you know, I, when are you, when are you <clears throat> using your, this is an aside, but when are you using your, um, fermented fruit juices like i'm i'm mm. not using them till super late and yes. i'm curious if i shouldn't right yeah. okay so yeah yeah okay yeah um yeah absolutely that's the same that i use them only uh you know about the last month of growth for for uh cannabis and hemp is when i'm using them definitely yeah just only for the real the real finishing um you know, the, the flavor enhancing and yeah. um, all that good sugar, you know, giving that to the plants. Um, so, yeah, really only in the last stages there. Now, are you using soil drenches all the way through on a large scale or are mm. you doing any kind of foliars? Like when do you do that? When do you transition and all that? You know, I, I primarily uh, I found that doing foliars, this is another way of kind of scaling up. Um, we're pretty lucky. We just got some fancy equipment. So we got this like orchard tractor that's only like, you know, four feet wide that has sprayers like that go up to about seven feet high and they have three sprayers. We just got this. I'm super stoked. This will be. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> really stoked to use this. It's, um, it'll be nice to kind of like get through the rows. It's, it's, you know, it's good because you can get through really tight spaces in, in your rows. And so for, for hemp fields, you can kind of get in there and we, so we'll plant, you know, three rows and then we'll have basically a five foot road for our tractor to get through uh, mm -hmm. that has our sprayers on it. Mm -hmm. uh, this is brand new. So um, I'm really excited to be using that for our KNF and Jadam foliars. Um, yeah. But generally what I do is I use like an atomizer or backpack sprayer and I have been doing a lot of foliars that way in like our greenhouses. Um, so I do drenches, but you're going to use a lot more inputs that way as well. So, yeah. you know, another a way to kind of scale up and conserve some of your inputs and make them go a little further, I found, is, is through foliar sprays. And do you carry your foliars all the way through bloom or is there a point when you mm. don't? Yeah, so <clears throat> we have a, a light depth going right now that's a couple weeks from harvest. I just mm -hmm. did, generally towards the end, I like to do, well, the old term flush from like, you know, back in the day from, you know, indoors and, and <laughs> using like salt-based uh, newts. Um, yeah. I, don't, I don't like to really use that term anymore, but, but yeah, I do soaks towards the end of uh, the final stages. I don't, I don't like to do, uh, I cut off foliars about two weeks before harvest. I find yeah. that, yeah, you know, I find that you're just introducing more moisture into the phylosphere. Like you can cause, you know, mildew, mold, botrytis, uh, and maybe damage some of the trichomes too, if, if you're, you know, spraying too heavy. So yeah. generally like, yeah, I just, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll do, um, soil drenches in the last few weeks. Yeah, that's, yeah, I, yeah, but I, I carry a little, yeah, I carry it past the fifth weeks into six weeks. Okay. Quite often, so yeah, I was nice. curious if I've heard that it some people don't do it that far in, but I've not found a problem with it, but yeah, way deep into bloom. I'm, I'm not gonna, yeah, same reason. So that's yeah. interesting. Yeah. So, um, Talk about the talk about harvesting and when you're wild harvesting for mm. things. Um, let's get into the etiquette mm. around. Um, great, great. Around sure. Harvesting. Yeah, great. I I I'd love to get into this topic. So, I have some formal training in herbalism. Um, uh, had a a year, um, course that I did in in Humboldt County with uh, Dandelion Herbal Center. Was really fortunate to go through that program and uh jane bothwell my teacher um she's uh you know very very close with rosemary gladstar which which 
um, the course also, I took Rosemary Gladstar's course as well, Sage Mountain. Um, so I was able to work, um, actually use KNF practices at Dandelion Herbal Center to pay for my tuition for herbalism class. So that nice. really worked. Yeah, yeah, that worked out great. That's stacked um, functioning for you. Right, yeah, multi-stacking <laughs> functions, uh, permaculture for sure. And so, um, so anyways, there was, there's a lot of etiquette involved in, in wild crafting and in approaching the natural world. And so, um, so when you walk into, um, a natural place, like, you know, into nature, um, we need to be really mindful of, of the space we're in and, and how we're approaching wild crafting. Um, I was always taught to, first of all, ask permission and always bring an offering as well. So you never go out just with the intention of taking, like you're mm -hmm. always giving something back too. So an offering, um, you know, tobacco is used a lot as an offering, but, but really anything, a piece of chocolate, um, just putting the intention out of like gratitude and, you know, and not just walking into nature and, and like, I'm here to take. So I was always taught, you know, ask for permission. And a lot of times you can talk to the plants and say, I would like to harvest you, say, for a certain reason. And so give that intention out. Um, but, you know, listen for feedback. What, what do you, what is your intention, intuition telling you uh, from these places that, that you're in? Um, asking to take. So <clears throat> let's just say that you do get good feedback. And, and um, so then I would only, let's say there's a stand of nettle. Okay. And <clears throat> I would only, first of all, for say FPJs, we really only need the top, you know, three to four inches for those growth hormones. So we don't have to rip out all those plants right we can just yeah. take the tops off them to let them regenerate and <clears throat> so we don't have to rip those plants out we can just take the tops of what we actually need now i would i would only harvest about it tops 40 percent of what i'm seeing i would always leave more than half mm -hmm. of what i'm seeing so i'm not going in and i'm not just like destroying a whole stand of nettles or, you know, just as an example, nettles, um, because, you know, this, this term regenerative, right? We don't just want it to be a catchphrase. We want to live these principles and practices. And so we want, we want to assist in, in regeneration. We can actually, wild crafting, you can be really destructive or you can actually assist in the growth and health of these wild places. Yes. Yeah, they thrive by our attention and by our harvesting if we're if we're in like in coordination with the living system that it's part of, right? Which is absolutely incorporates the reciprocity and the listening and the intuition as yes. well, and that we have the responsibility to attune ourselves to being able to listen to what the messages are, and yeah. that it's a real thing. I know absolutely. it's a spot question, do you, but do you have any sort of like magical moments out there harvesting when you've gotten a message or some kind of intuition about what you're doing that's kind of led you down a path? Do you have a specific moment? Mm. I know that's putting on the spot. I have them too, but I can't <laughs> recall Yeah, them. I, I do. I do. So another one of the um, herbalism schools that I've gone through is um, – the school of evolutionary herbalism, which is yes, um, I'm so jealous. <laughs> <laughs> Sage Apotham, who's an amazing herbalist and, um, yeah. you know, alchemist, spagyricist. Uh, that was kind of my entrance into, you know, spagyric alchemy, which is herbalism, you know, uh, alchemical herbalism. So, you know, he talks about this idea of, um, you know, heart coherence. And so we can mm -hmm. actually commu communicate with plants by doing plant sits and sitting with them. And if we're, we open our hearts like to this intuitive faculty, right? It's not, it's not this mental, like today yeah. in this day and age, there's a lot of emphasis put on the logical reductionistic science mind, right? But 
the intuitive heart is really important when we're working with nature, when we're working with plants. Plants are electromagnetic receivers and transmitters, and, and, and we can tap into those frequencies with our heart if we're, a, if we're able to listen. And so, uh, well, one, one story I'll give you is, um, so um, Devil's Club, Opelo Panics, um, is a really powerful um, plant used by many of the indigenous tribes of the Pacific Northwest. And <clears throat> it's, it's a very, very powerful medicine. And so I was on this quest to find Devil's Club. I was really stoked and, and interested to find Devil's Club. And, and, and I know it grows around the Columbia Gorge, basically uh, kind of Northern Oregon up into Washington and up into like BC and even into Alaska. And then it also, for some reason, it, it has a, like a cousin that grows around Lake Michigan. So it's out there too. Interesting. Uh, yeah, it is, huh? So the third coast, right? Um, <laughs> so anyways, with the Devil's Club, I, uh, I'm not going to give the specific location because it's, it's yeah. really special to me. But Sacred. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm driving. Okay, so I was, at, I was over in Eugene. And uh, I was giving a talk on Korean natural farming at uh, a permaculture convergence that happened there. And so I was heading over to Ben to a friend's farm afterwards and heading through the Willamette National Forest. And I stopped by um, at a local waterfall and I had kind of given up on my search thinking that, okay, it's, I got to go up to like the Columbia River to find this plant. Um, and I had kind of given up on, on my searches like that south of Oregon, more central Oregon. So I go to this waterfall and like I'm walking down into this ravine and like look up and it like literally knocked me over. Like the power of this plant like put me on my back, you know, because it just has these huge like maple looking leaves. It's such a powerful plant. And, like, the power of that, like, it really, like, I fell back and I just sat there with this plant in awe of, like, I found you and I can't believe it. <laughs> like, I've been looking for a long, long time. And uh, so, yeah, that's a very um, special plant. I, I, I've made some spagyric uh, preparations of this plant and... Um, just very very special it's it's uh it's been called like um alaskan ginseng it's kind of um a term that's not officially accepted but uh it's closely related to ginseng beautiful and so it, it works on a lot of different levels you know with with herbs you can learn a lot about herbs by by their flavors mm. you know like bitters work on your digestive system different um you know sweet herbs are, are very nutritive um so you can learn a lot about herbs and, and what their function is physiologically uh really by the, the flavors yeah. um and so devil's club is just all over the place super complex flavor so anytime you have a really complex flavor of a plant you know it's working on a lot of different levels mm -hmm. Mm. Do you have you you must have ingested it? Is it um? Mm. Has, did you have some effects from it that you especially loved? You know, it's very heart opening. It's very yeah. um, it's a very self empowering herb. You know, I think for for doing self work and mm. growth and, and things of that nature. Um, and I think shamanically, this is also what, what tribes of the Pacific Northwest use this herb for as well. Um, so really, that's kind of the level that, that I use it. Um, I see it as a very sacred um, Deep plant. and ceremonial. Mm, yes, absolutely. That's yeah. gorgeous. Thank you for sharing that story. Mm. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> definitely. Do you, do you have, I'd love to hear one of your experiences with, with an herb. Um, maybe that spoke to you. 
Well, you know, I'll talk about one that's been speaking to me this mm -hmm. year. A uh, very surprising discovery because I actually had bought it and planted it and then just kind of noticed it popping up around the property because what I'm trying to do here is naturalize everything and so it takes uh -huh. about three years and it'll come, it'll present, but then it'll go away, it'll present into the second year and then by third year it's like massive and then by fourth year it's found its place usually it seems yeah. to be the pattern so this plant was I bought it I planted it even though I knew it's it's indigenous I still seeded it here but it, it's wild lettuce actually oh yeah so this, so this is the uh, first year that Lac I've yeah I've Lactuca. actually like, Lactuca canadense I love that plant yeah oh my god <laughs> yeah so, so I stumbled on because I make leaf protein, which I'm going to get uh -huh. into some later time. But uh, mm. I found out about that through my permaculture studies. It's a way of mm. of isolating the proteins in the plant. So mm. I started out with this plant. I, I finally so in weeding, well, I I'll take the plant. I'm actually harvesting. I'm not weeding. Uh -huh. So I set it aside and I decided to pull protein from it. I tried the protein, and it had an effect. Uh, and then I. I just sort of, I decided to, I realized that what was left was still had a lot of oiliness and sponginess to it. So I thought, and I, I don't tend to follow recipes. I let the plant tell me what to do. Yeah, so right. This, That's awesome. So I real, right. So I realized like, mm. this isn't, this isn't water soluble. So I, mm. I put the, the mass of uh, stuff that I'd already juiced, taken the juice, taken the protein out of it, put it in mm. alcohol. The mm. alcohol turned the most lovely color of blue I've ever seen. Oh, wow. Like okay. Blue green. So wow. I was like, oh, this is interesting. So I tried a bit off of it. Yeah. Uh, and the effect was incredible. Like it acted on mm. the central nervous system. It got rid yes. of pain. It definitely, but it sort of woke me up to the reality that I'm much, because I've had issues sleeping for the last year and that's unusual for me. But I wasn't really being affected in any other way. I thought I was behaving normally. Well, this plant taught me that I am super jacked in my central nervous system and that I need mm -hmm. a lot of nurturing. This plant has opened me up this year to sort of being able to surrender deeper, being able to feel mm -hmm. at home in my own garden, being able to feel safe in my own environment and do some profound healing. Awesome. And yeah. I, and it's like plant guided. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Isn't that so cool? I love yes. that. That's like the, the initiatic um, properties of plants. You know, that, that's really what Spagyric yes. gets into. It's like all yes. different plants, like you get into the archetypes and, and there's, there's <sighs> lessons that these plants have to teach us. Each you know? plant, I know. <laughs> yeah. It's so cool. So cool. Actually, um, I, I want to send share... you some of the tincture. Oh, I loved, I loved some. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll, I know I'll send... I owe you in time. You sent me. <laughs> Preston sent well, me some stuff that saved my hemp crop last year because I, I well, needed some. Anyway, you did. I felt really bad service. because the bottle, like you, you sent me a picture of the package and it was like crushed and like you know maybe a quarter <laughs> of the way full. It was all you know the box was drenched. <laughs> right, but, but ironically, it was the perfect amount that was left to finish out my harvest. So it was the mm. universe saying, "Yeah, you might have wanted more, but this is what you're going to work with. And it's perfect." <laughs> nice, nice. Yeah, so, <laughs> I love I love to talk about about that specific plant that i sent you to please um, do okay was, yeah do you want to get into that right now or yeah we might as well it's okay, so okay. <laughs> yeah okay great so um the plant that i sent to tina was uh bay california bay laurel that's californica uh umbel umbelularium um umbelularia excuse me um and it is a very very potent plant it has um it has a compound called umbella umbellalone and mm. it's one of the volatile oils of of california bay and <clears throat> so how i came upon this plant and how i thought about using it as a pesticide like a jadam pesticide was through my herbalism studies i was looking at um, some of the Native American uses of, of California Bay. And um, the, the uses that I found 
was um, it was used it was used to protect acorns. Like when some of the native tribes um, cool. were were processing acorns, they would put California Bay around the acorns to protect that acorn meal because there's a process of leaching out those tannins and acorns yeah. to produce bread. So they would, they would protect it with the California bay leaves to, you know, uh, keep away insects or opportunistic, you know, whatever from, from, you know, getting the acorns. So when I heard that, I was like, okay, this has potential for, you know, Jadam, um, yeah, a Jadam pesticide. And sure enough, yeah. it definitely does have way more potential. I've been using this um, as my primary go-to for all kinds of problems. Um, for, for example, uh, last year when I first got to the hemp farm I'm currently working with, there's a horrible infestation of hemp aphids. Mm -hmm. And so I... I had some of the California Bay. I made a Jadam herbal solution, which is essentially an herbal decoction that you do with water. Uh, you know, just boil it, steam it, um, trap all those volatile oils, and then you would mix that with the uh, Jadam wetting agent, which is essentially uh, a Castile soap. Um, and so I mixed the two together and found that perfect rate to where we had a bunch of ladybugs you know that came to save the day too so <clears throat> i was trying to find that perfect balance of okay where can i destroy like all of the hemp aphids but also save the lady but the lady beetles and their larva mm. so and i found that balance and so we had this crazy infestation of hemp aphids and the first application i used of the California Bay Laurel with the wetting agent took care of most of the problem. I mean, probably 80% of the aphids were gone after one application. True. The, the second application, I came back a week later, mm -hmm. sprayed again, totally done. Mm -hmm. Two applications yep. and, uh, and they were toast. So yeah. I've also used the Bay Laurel for uh, powdery mildew, botrytis, um, russet mites. Yes. You know, Wendy was talking about that application uh, this year uh, at the regenerative conference. Um, and basically our trials, your trials went, um, Tina and Wendy's yep. as well with the, yep. with the, um, with the California Bay Laurel. So yeah, um, it's, cool. it is an absolute all-star. So I only yep. use a couple of other herbs for pesticides. I'll use like bracken fern, Ginkgo, mm. ginkgo biloba is, you know, one of um, Cho Young San's favorite, uh, but it's just not as potent and effective, I found, as, as the Bay Laurel is just an all-star. So Chris is asking, uh, Chris Chomp has joined the room. He says, have you used the JWA by itself? Yes. I think he was trialing that just this last week. So Yeah, I have. <laughs> uh, specifically for hemp aphids, I didn't find that it, it took care of the problem. It, it does help. I mean, even with normal aphids, you can just spray them off with water and, yeah, right. and, and it doesn't kill them, but you, you at least kind of make it. Yeah. Disrupt their, their, their flow. And yeah. uh, so I have used the wetting agent by itself, but I haven't found that it, that it will kill all the aphids. When yeah. you cup, when you couple that with the uh, Bay Laurel, the now we, is amazing. Now we really got a, a powerful weapon to, to use against them. And it, and it was amazing because it didn't kill the ladybugs either. They were, they were thriving. That yeah. is so cool to hear. And That's I can cool. talk, I can talk about the ratios that I used. Um, yeah, please do. Okay. So um, let's see here. Cause I, I have it written down what I used and I found the same thing to be true. It took two applications and also just to comment on the power of uh, using nat Korean natural farming or natural farming methods in conjunction with all this is that like it gave the plant a break from the onslaught 
in enough time for the application or for its what it was getting from um, the natural farming applications to just come rushing forth. So they both act in just right. concert with each other, which was very evident. Right. Yeah. So um, I, I... I love you too, Chris. <laughs> we love you. <laughs> I'm glad you're joining. I'm glad to see you <laughs> here. <laughs> he just said he loves us both. <laughs> oh, I love you too, Chris. <laughs> I just uh, love I love the community that is happening around natural farming. It's like community happens the best and the most lasting when we're actually doing things that are helpful and that yeah, are truly yeah. helpful. And then when right. we're finding when we're abundantly helpful to ourselves and what's around us, then we're abundantly helpful with each other, which is kind of it's just this natural outflow happens and Yeah, you know, definitely. Absolutely. So I, it's such a great community, you know, uh, and what I find is really cool is just, you know, people sharing their experiences, being op open source with, yes. you know, these practices in a different region, because I've been fortunate to, to practice this, you know, go around and train in Hawaii and go to, you know, practice in California and Oregon and, and out in Idaho with Chris and the soil smiths. And uh, it's so cool to see how, um, you know, those different leverage points, um, and how, it, how it changes. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a different approach wherever you're at, there's, it's yes. going to be a little different. And I think that's really important to keep in mind. We don't want to get too fixed and like, Oh, but. So we were going to talk about your ratios. We might as well cover that. And we got another hour. Yeah. And then if we can go three hours, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah. Um, so the ratio that I'm using for uh, the California Bay Laurel yeah. with uh, Jadam Wedding Agent. Uh, I, I use this for dealing with uh, hemp aphids and found that it also uh, saved the ladybugs and their larvae. So that ratio was um, a half ounce of the um, Jadam Herbal Solution. So essentially, just to go over that for, for people unfamiliar, that's that's a decoction of bay laurel. You essentially take all the leaves and you would simmer that in a pot, covered pot, and you would you would make a strong herbal decoction from that. So, you know, you bring it to boil and let that simmer for, I usually let it simmer for hour and a half or so uh, to get all those good volatile compounds out of it. And then, so then you have your, uh, your decoction, also known as uh, Jadam Herbal Solution. And you can mix that with your uh, your carrier, which is the JWA, the Jadam wedding agent. Uh, <clears throat> so, again, the uh, the ratio on that is a half an ounce of the Bay Laurel Jadam herbal solution, the decoction. And I would mix two ounces of the Jadam wedding agent per gallon. And so I found that was that really worked awesome for for dealing with hemp aphids and again saving the the lady beetles so that's kind of that's kind of the balance you're looking for and uh what you can do is just pull a leaf off you know create a little laboratory wherever you're at just pull a leaf off your your crop that's infected with whatever you're trying to combat and then you can just mix these solutions to find the the appropriate ratio that's working mm. so you're basically treating some infested part and then looking under a microscope or a magnifying glass to see the effect on the population and then going with that ratio absolutely yeah yep and also it's important right to use uh non like i i did i first i made it in with just using spring water which is heavily mineral but no you it's like no you want to use it in acidic still. Yeah, you yeah. Want, right. That's a good point. You have to use uh, rainwater is what I always use because oh, it's, nice. it's, yeah. it's more it's more acidic. If you use a more alkaline water, then okay. um, that's it's not going to mix correctly. And and if you're making uh, liquid soap, such as you know Jadam wedding agent, um, a um, uh, you know a liquid Castile soap, you have to also use uh, more acidic water. If it's too al alkaline, it's not going to work. 
And a good visual in case you don't have a pH around is, or if you don't know what water you're using is when it's cloudy, it's not, it, that's alkaline, yes. but when it's more clear, it's more acidic. So you can know that way, right? Exactly. Yep. That's true. Cool. And it does make a difference. Big difference. Yeah. yeah. Big difference. Yeah. It won't, it won't mix correctly. You'll see like oh. when you, when you have it mixed properly, you'll see bubbles form. Uh, whereas when you don't, it, it, it becomes cloudy and, and, and it doesn't look the same. So, so yeah, you, you definitely know when you've made correct, um, you know, soap. Very cool. So do you ever use the JWA in, uh, or have you, have you, what do you, what are your thoughts on using it in concert with like applications of, um, you know, type two or type three? Do you feel like, cause I just, okay. So I just did a type two, which is using the fish amino acids and, I had so much oil that mm -hmm. I ended up adding a little of the JWA just to get the oil to, um, to mix with the water a bit. Do you, do, how do you feel about that? Do you think that's kind of a adulteration um, or is that? No, okay? no. Like I'm, I'm open to that kind of experimentation. Uh, I don't think it's adulteration. Um, I just haven't personally had a need for that. I know, I know some people are, are scraping the, the oils off of their FAA. I generally keep okay. my, my FAA, I keep it, uh, I like to keep it whole, whole so I, I like to keep those yeah. oils in there. Yeah, um, so you just shake it up while you're applying? And... Yeah, exactly. Yep. So I haven't really experimented with using oils of fish in that, in that way, that approach. Yeah. Um, but if, if it's working for you, then yeah, I yeah, That's I just awesome. did it. Just I just did it this last time. I don't know if it's cool. Or not. Okay. <laughs> I just wanted to know yeah. if you knew. If you knew. <laughs> yeah, you know, I've I've been so stoked with my results with the the bay laurel and the the wedding yeah. agent. It's such a powerful combination that honestly, I don't even really uh, look for um, other herbs to really use. Um, and there, I'd like to say this much. Okay, so. At the regenerative conference this last year, there was a speaker and I'm not going to name names or, you know, throw any, anybody under the bus, but there was a speaker talking about pesticides and, and she mentioned that a petroleum based product was less of a, um, had less of an environmental impact than using certain herbs. And she was totally putting down the use of herbs as pesticides. And I was just like mind blown, like what this lady is talking about this at a regenerative conference, um, basically saying the environmental impact of harvesting herbs is greater than using some petroleum extracted product. Okay. So we have to well, be careful. Seems, let's yeah. call it, let's call it out. Cause this to me is one of the major conversations <clears throat> that needs to happen out there for us to sort of wake up to our regenerative place in the world mm -hmm. i feel like there are basically two camps of people there are, are the people who feel like we are part of nature and that we're our place is necessary here that we're part of the ecosystem and then there are people who are being convinced and taught and believe that that people are the problem mm. and like i'm and like so um in, in like for instance in wild harvesting and wild crafting mm. it's been shown that like if you're doing proper harvesting and you're keeping to that 40% ratio that you spoke to earlier, mm -hmm. then that stand of wild plants will actually flourish and thrive under your stewardship and care. Mm. And so yeah. if we come into proper stewardship with our planet, we are very much a part of the garden. In Absolutely. Fact, like, yeah. Essential to the garden. Right. Right. So I feel like, you know, yeah, maybe the, you know, making the argument that us harvesting and wild crafting is going to be harmful is just, it's just, it's because we need to learn how to come into harmony with our world. Yeah, I agree. And it could be like, if you're, if we go back to like devastating that stand of nettle we were talking about, then it yeah. could be destructive. Uh, but right. I, I think the argument is very hard to make that a petroleum extracted product is less damaging uh, to the earth than using yeah. herbs. And for me, it comes down to bay laurel again. It's like these massive trees grow in Northern California. In Oregon, it's known as um, Oregon myrtle. It's the same oh, plant in Oregon. Cool. Up here, up here, we have our own 
name down there. It's California Bay Laurel. Um, but anyways, so, I mean, these these trees grow massive and there's and it's so potent like you don't need much like a branch of this i can make enough to spray four greenhouses um you know 100 foot by 30 foot and take care of an aphid infestation with one branch off of a huge tree That's so there's not problem. much of an environmental impact going on there yeah and i'm, working, think, and I'm doing this on a large scale too do you think that you're losing i mean I'm I'm sold on the method because it works so well. But have you ever thought about like capturing, being a spagyrist, capturing the essential mm. oils first, and then sort of using a spagyric approach of re, you know, like adding those volatiles back into? Have you done much? Inter interesting, you ask. Here, <laughs> <laughs> here is uh, the sulfur uh, or the um, essential oil of bay laurel, and so. Oh, that's beautiful. Now, now I'm doing distillations of um, the. You can see the the bubbles are. That's gorgeous. So did that, yeah. did, did you have to open your windows and doors to do that? Or was... Yeah. Oh, that's another thing I should mention. If you're working with bay laurel, you do not want to do this in your house. I mean, yeah. there's a reason it's a powerful pesticide, and um, it is very, very powerful. I mean, it's actually one of its nicknames is is a headache tree because it causes gives umbellalone that uh, volatile oil causes headaches in a lot of people okay. um i'm unfortunate it doesn't for me absolutely love the the smell of bay um yeah. but this is this is really powerful stuff now so how I, much how much uh material did it take to do that yeah so this this was uh this much here yeah was um i'm working with uh two liter distillation apparatus that's what and, i have okay cool nice uh so this was uh let's see like two two distillations so my bio okay. flask my bio flask um essentially this is is two distillations of two two liters of uh, bay laurel so honestly like yeah. not all that much it's it's very high in these in, in these volatile compounds and they're very powerful so i am experimenting now with doing distillations and adding straight essential oils into my uh Jadam wedding agent yeah. rather than rather than doing the the herbal decoction but the herbal decoction works really well too it's is, is plenty right are yeah. you going so far as to burn to white ash and add the minerals or anything like that crazy stuff mm -hmm. You know, I haven't done like a spagyric application uh, yeah. for the plants, but I think it would be very effective. I really do. Yeah. It's just, you know, you know where I, I want to use it, you know, where I want to use it is in the, is in the vinegars. Yeah. So after, so after making the FPJs, taking that plant material, making the vinegar, and then taking the leftover plant material, taking it to white ash, deriving the minerals and putting it back into the vinegars. Yeah. But then it's yeah. going to change the pH. So I'm kind of like. Anyway, right. We'll no, have another be, discussion would... <laughs> about spadirics one of these days. Yeah, we should, because that that's a that's a deep rabbit hole right yeah, there, it and uh, it's it's a very exciting um, method and, and very ancient um, ancient roots into antiquity. So, um, what's they're, your they're... Fe what's your feeling on the relationship between spadirics and natural farming? Because I see them kind of like pretty hand in hand. Are you caught by that? Um, you know, I've often wondered, uh, some of the approaches to Korean natural farming do have some alchemical kind of, um, background and, uh, you know, I think, I think one of them that strikes me is the, the preparation of OHN, for instance, we do a fermentation before we actually uh, do a, a tincture. And so that's very, that's very similar to how you would approach a spagyric too. Um, in yeah. a spagyric, you would, you would release the, uh, the sulfur or the essential oil first, the soul of that plant, and then you would do a fermentation to release the spirits. Mm -hmm. So in Korean natural farming, we are doing fermentation along with our, uh, with our distillation. So, it's it gets it's similar to the alchemical approach for sure yes. uh we're we're not taking it as far as as calcinating down the plant matter and you know adding the salts back to it but 
you know, there are elements of, of alchemy within uh, Korean knots of farming is definitely, um, you know, an esoteric science. Yeah. And I know, uh, I, I believe one of Master Cho's teachers was really inspired by uh, Rudolf Steiner of uh, biodynamic farming. And, you know, he was very much into alchemy. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, it's, it's fun to explore the interface. So, have, yeah. so have we touched on everything that you ha that's in your outline? Mm. Preston, Preston prepared an outline for this. I was so like thrilled with that. <laughs> So I want to know. Well, I, I did. However, I've been bouncing all over the place, not really using it. Um, so I guess I could go back and just kind of talk more about, you know, my favorite herbs as far as FPJs. Yeah, mm -hmm. Okay, great. So, you know, as I was talking about earlier, the idea of, of really trying to grow your own fertilizer. So part of your crop thinking ahead of time, like how many, how many, like if we're doing acre, um, Ooh, phone battery is getting uh -oh. kind of low here. Uh-oh. <laughs> okay, uh -oh. I'm going to talk fast. <laughs> okay, okay. I might have to go plug in here. Um, do you yeah. want to do? You want to try to do that? Or what do you yeah. want to do? Yeah, I'm going to make my way over and plug in while, while okay. I'm talking here. Yeah, let's do that. You so, might have, we don't want to lose you. Okay. Because we'll just still all this stuff down talking about spagyrics. Like, my intent for these... Uh, conversations is to gather as much material as possible and then condense down later and come out with you know some kind of a podcast that we can all use together so um, we want to make sure we get all the information from you that you wanted to share yeah so i would i would be thinking first and foremost about growing some of your own fertilizers um so that would be on my mind first secondly i would be looking for plants that are really showing up for you that are in abundance you know different um you know plants that are possibly invasives in your area that are are taken over um they make great fertilizers you know things like fennel um mm. really juicy horsetail fennel um comfrey they make great fertilizers because they they render a lot of juices mm. yeah somebody's asking about seaweed fpj seaweed fpj is awesome definitely because it's very abundant if you live on the coast and excuse me i'm just plugging in real quick so yeah seaweed fpj it's it's very abundant so I like to look for, you know, herbs, plants like that, that are, that are very abundant, you know, because there's never going to be a shortage. So mm. seaweed FPJ is awesome. I also like to do, um, you know, Jadam style liquid ferments with seaweed. That can be really fun too. So let's see. Look at my list. Are you here. are your horse tail? Are you making a traditional FPJ out of that? And are, are you find that to be a juicy plant? Oh, absolutely! It's one, okay. it renders one of the like the most juices out of a lot of the FPJs that I I make. Um, nice. You know, so right now it's getting more mature. So as the name implies, it looks like a horse tail. The um, the leaves kind of. Um, fray out and it looks like a horsetail the best time really to harvest it is before it does that when their shoots okay. are just coming right out of the ground okay. um, before it opens up and oh. there's a ton of juices in, in horsetail so it's one of my favorite FPJs because you know let's just uh, compare it with nettle what I was finding from nettle FPJ to um, horsetail FPJ I would get about twice the juices from horsetail that I would nettles so being strategic about what we're harvesting too for large scale um nettle is a lot of work to it, it makes a great fpj super nutrient dense um but it's you know it's a lot of work to to harvest um for making large scale you know fpj um, fermented plant juices so 
roots. I like to use skunk cabbage because it's very abundant. It, it, it's very juicy. Fennel, again, is awesome. Also very abundant on the coast. Very juicy. Uh, comfrey, growing comfrey makes a great FPJ. Also renders a lot of juice. So really there's only, for larger scale stuff, there's really, to me, it's even using nettle. It's like I do make nettle FPJs, but I'm very careful with my application of those. I'll use them in a foliar spray because, you know, it's it's just so hard to, to render a, a lot of juice from it. Mm-hmm. So um, this is where... What's your application the, rate? I mean, what's your... Um... What's how much material are you using per acre typically? That's a great question. Like um, material as far as making FPJs. Yeah. Like how much are you having to harvest per acre? Do you have that number or do you know? I haven't done those calcs because yeah. for me, as I mentioned earlier, I'm, I'm substituting in Jadam liquid fertilizers as well. Yeah. So, um, yeah. It's hard for me to say, Um, you know, I do pickle barrel batches of nettle and horsetail. So, um, you know, I'm able to have about 10 gallons of, um, you know, nettle FPJ and horsetail. uh, I I get about 10 gallons from, from the same amount of material. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm using that very carefully in foliar sprays i do some soil drenches but primarily i'm I'm using the foliar sprays uh to help make that go further um and then as i mentioned substituting in the jadam liquid fertilizers is also i find that too um yeah it's just it's easier to to make jadam liquid fertilizer than it is fermented plant juice there's there's more resource sources for it you essentially just chop up you know, grasses and weeds and whatever you have and, and throw it in a ferment in water and you have a fertilizer. So it really simplifies it. You don't have to go buy a bunch of sugar. Um, so, so anyways, yeah, I like, I like the combination of the two. Nice. What are you doing for your vinegars? Are you making your own vinegars from your material from your FPJs or are you using brown rice vinegar? Or? Yeah, I am. I am. Yeah. Um, I nice. love making vinegars. I love yeah. um, in Korean nacho farming. I'm always, it's, I'm always joking and it's not really a joke. It's true. But like the byproducts of Korean nacho farming are, are cheese and wine and vinegar. <laughs> you know? so, Gorgeous. <laughs> um, so I love that. And so with, the spent um you know the fpj solids that are left over after your fermented plant juices uh yeah you can you can make vinegars from those you can throw it in a tub full of you know so one part plant with like two parts water and some usually there's enough extra sugar that you'll Mm -hmm. be all right you could toss some extra sugar in there and then you could pitch like a kombucha or a jun scoby in there um, that really kickstarts the process. I, I use John Scobies with all my vinegars. Um, made some really nice like mugwort vinegars and nettle mm-hmm. vinegars. Um, you can also make wines, you know, which would, essentially it's the same thing, only you would do an anaerobic ferment rather than aerobic ferment for the vinegars, anaerobic for the wine. Uh, do you so, throw extra yeast in there? Yeah, yeah, I do pitch my own yeast. Yeah, I mean, Theoretically, you could you could pitch some uh, local material, some plant matter, some fruit, and, and inoculate with a local yeast. But I usually kickstart like I'll, primarily I'm using a Jun culture uh, for for all my vinegars. Um, and then, so to take that a step further with these plants, so let's say we made fermented plant juice um, of mugwort. Let's just say. So then you would collect your juices. You'd have those solids. You can make a wine or vinegar out of those, right? And then when you're done with that, what I'm doing with those scraps now is I'm actually making a mixed compost. And this year I made, um, with all my food scraps, I, I did a mixed compost with all my spent vinegar and FPJ solids and then all my food scraps. And 
I was amazed at, uh, I did this mixed compost pile with all that layered in, um, you know, cardboard and did kind of a lasagna with IMO sprinkled in and soaked my cardboard in lactic acid bacteria and just oh, kind wow. of did, did layers and created the most beautiful compost that I'm going to make an IMO five with. It's a mixed compost. And, um, I mean, wow. just from my food scraps and the, the solids from these vinegars and stuff, you know, I made like a whole truck bed full of compost and, uh, I just, wow. uh, top, top dressed my veggie garden with all that. <clears throat> That's beautiful. Yeah. So, so really we, we can, we have three steps to, to using that plant. I mean, you know, there, there is no waste, um, you know, waste is a human design flaw in nature. There is no waste. Uh, it's, it's a principle I take seriously. That's beautiful. Good job. Oh, thank you. <laughs> you too. I love, I love what you're up to. These clay balls have me fascinated. Oh, I'm going to send you some, I'm going to send you Great. some and I want to, I want your feedback on them. They're, they're, they, they surprise me all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So where did, so. where did you get the inspiration for that? Was that? Well, I'm still, I'm still, everybody, I'm still planting out there. I'm still going to be working on this video, which is full disclosure, but I might as well take this opportunity to do it. I mean, the recipe for the fermented clay comes from the, the green book, the swarm right. book, right? Okay. The swarm yeah. or whatever. Right. So basically that's going to give you the basic fermented clay recipe. And then I took that further and uh, cool. added um, cr and did the Bokashi from that. And I also actually will take that opportunity. I'm going to be, I have, this is, I'll send you some of this too. This is the Bokashi from the same, nice. the same inoculant. Um, so everybody cool. can do it. Uh, I still think we should be supporting each other in economy, so please do still buy my balls, but make your own as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know? I'll, I'll buy it. But yeah, I got sure. the recipe from that, so it's like, you know, it's a whole process, so you're um, utilizing pond water, and I mean, I'm, I'm throwing a bunch of stuff in there. Like, the I'm, I'm making sure that I'm getting into that biofilm at the, in the, in the, in the, pristine pond areas and just trying to capture um, as much of that strata as I yeah. can. And what I, I mean, what I'm just talk about the sort of crosstalk that happens when we get involved with these natural systems and how our intuition works and how, you know, I mean, natural farming really does bring forward this ability to communicate with nature in ways that we're not used to, right? right. So just yes. working with these balls and working with the facultatives and the anaerobic bacteria, I'm, I'm looking at the entire world differently. Like I'm seeing everything from the clays, the salts, the silts, all the way up to the layers of facultative into the aerobics and into those top layers and into the trophic layers of insects and animals and plants. And then like trees and clouds and sky, like we're all in these, stra it's a stratification. And like it, we're all, there's crosstalk going on all through that system. And there is no waste and we are a part of it, a part of nature. And there's just this infinite level of communication that happens all the way from the clays to the clouds and then a circular motion all the way back through. So anyway, that <laughs> I sounded stoned just now, <laughs> but it's yeah. just these balls that just be working with these guys, working with the facultatives has, has taught me so much about, the layers, I guess, the stratification, the way, gotcha, yeah. the way nature, the way life evolved, the way the way life evolves from from clay, the way mm. we come from clay, right? And the way that's the amplification moment. That's kind of the moment when clay becomes food, and there's this like amplification that happens from there. And if we can start, you um riding that wave and helping that amplification to happen, then we start to see this, this regenerative cycle start to happen. Right. Yeah. Oh, I love that. It's great. Very cool. Yeah. yeah so I yeah, I learned this in this book. Huh? I haven't experimented with the clays or um, 
yeah, there's some really cool stuff in that, that SARM book I've been checking out. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and I think as a community, if we're, if we're playing, let's be transparent about it all and, you know, supporting of each other. So I'll, yeah, I'll send you some of these and I'd love to hear back what you end up doing with them. Great. They're so great. easy. You can just like nice. in, in the reservoir, you just drop them in. You don't even have to aerate. I mean, I love the anaerobics. Wow. It's just they're very low love, like low maintenance. Nice. So where are you? And they're actually you getting... cleaning my pumps. Wow, really? Are yeah. you getting the clay? Are you getting the clay from the pond too? Or where do you harvest your clay? No. I'm getting I'm actually working with different kinds of clay right now. Okay. Um I think every clay probably has a different a different quality. Um mm -hmm. this particular clay I'm getting from an area that's very has been extremely active. Like there's you can find dinosaur bones in this canyon. Like it's, nice. you know, I think the clay is pretty uh, phenomenal. It's a red clay. Um, oh, nice. But it's, yeah. But I'm, I'm some, kind of experimenting some... with greens and white clays right now too. Oh, cool. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of gray clay along the coast. I've found, you know, big sections of gray clay. So it'd be fun to experiment yeah. with that. <clears throat> Oh yeah, and Jess, I know when she did some fermented clay, she got a lot of the um, the purple sulfur loving stuff. So oh nice, uh, but, but I don't, I didn't get some. I don't know. Layton's gonna help me figure out what's in these. Great, but great. Just, but I mean, talk about observation being a guide, like just understanding that these that this clay is an. an insane food supply for insects informs me of what kind of anaerobes we're dealing with and that there's actually a natural source of chitin oh yes from the anaerobic community oh so really we don't have to have yes Yes. So I don't need to go Which... collect crab shells from the beach and do uh -uh. it uh Jadam style liquid ferment <laughs> No, I think it's simpler. I think you can get it in wow. clay. Wow. Cool. I like that idea. Right? I know. Yeah, so, I've yeah. Been, uh, I have done some of the um, Jadon style, like the chitin with um, crab shells. Uh, yeah, what was your down. result from that? Um, I really liked it. Yeah, I I found it to be very effective. And just, it's so, I always joke with Jadon, it's like, yeah, just toss it in a bucket of water with leaf mold and and you're good. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, from from human waste to, you know, from food scraps to plants to, you know, shells to to whatever. I mean, that's kind of the approach. Yeah, it's just kind let of the it break approach. Down. Yeah. Yep. Let um, nature do it. Right. Oh. So cool. All right. Well, I have a huge package to get off to you. It's going to include some of the, some of the uh, lettuce. Awesome. Awesome. Oh my God. I can't it's wait. Gonna, it's going to have clay balls in it. And I promise you, I'm going to get that off today. Actually today. I'm going to do that. for you. Awesome. Today. Awesome. Thank um, you. I'm stoked. Is there anything else that we need to cover that are in your notes or anything else you want to talk about real quick? As we kind of um, you know while we're on the wedding agent um yeah i would like to talk about real quick i mean pretty much covered what i wanted to as far as um plants and wild crafting and kind of mixing jadam and um and can if both if anybody wants to add some questions on on any of that you know we could take some questions but um, yeah. You know, while we're kind of talking about Jadam wedding agent, um, there's so many uses for this. You know, it's a surfactant. It's it's a it's a wedding agent, so you can put it in your reservoirs to help with the lateral disbursement of feeds in your soil. Um, you know, it's a surfactant, so you can use it in your foliar sprays to help as a carrier to carry some of these herbs and and other additive sulfur or, or what have you, um, you know, mineral sands are, are also good to intensify insecticides in, 
you know, in oh. this horticultural soap. Um, but I'd like to share wow. this. So I've been making I've been making a lot more biochar uh, this last couple of years. I've been doing a lot of biochar. Super stoked about biochar. I think it's oh, it's yeah. um, it, it, it's the best amendment you could put in the ground, especially when you charge it. And I feel like Korean Natural Farming has amazing tools. So does Jadam for helping to charge biochar. So mm -hmm. I know this wasn't scheduled in for the subjects uh, of talk on, on this specific talk, but um, yeah. one other application I thought was really cool in regards to um, biochar was, so I was in Bend, I was, um, I was doing a burn in Bend at a friend's farm. I was being consulted to make some biochar and we had four acres of hemp residue, this massive pile of hemp. And so we dug this huge pit and, um, you know, like 10 guys from the neighborhood came over and we started a fire and we're just, you know, chucking big trees of, you know, hemp trees into this fire to keep this fire fed. And, um, we burned all the way through the day and then it, you know, it got dark. And so we were burning a bit into the dark and then the fire department showed up and they're like, you guys can't burn into the dark you're like you're good you're on ag land like you you dug this huge pit you guys are all good there but like you just can't burn into the night and we're like okay we'll put it out and then he kind of like the firefighter laughed at me because we have this huge pile like this volcano of you know biochar that's still smoldering and um yeah. so i'm out there with a hose just hosing it down and he said he's he mentioned he's like well just use a wedding agent, go get some dish soap. And it like triggered in my mind. I was like, yes, that's it. Because <laughs> when, when you're trying to extinguish a pile of biochar, like, a, yeah. first of all, that's a big pile like that. There's evaporation happening, but a lot of it's going straight down. Whereas like if you add, so what you can do is add some of the, the, the wedding agent to that water that you're quenching your biochar with, and it's going to help extinguish that better because it helps with the lateral disbursement rather than just going vertical down so you can put out a fire a lot easier yeah i bet it has a quality too i bet it kind of helps with the uh penetration i bet it helps with the inoculation i'll bet it has qualities i think so too yeah i'm, I'm continuously amazed at all the applications for for wedding agents um yeah. i mean household uses too but but in the in the garden it's it's amazing so i thought that very, was really cool i was cool. like yes of course like you can use jwa like to extinguish biochar too um because i mean we, we literally had a sprinkler on our this massive pile of biochar four acres of hemp that was reduced down and wow. i had a sprinkler sprinkler going all night and uh and um you know, it still was is still smoldering the next day. So, you know, we weren't super efficient. Some of it went to ash. You know, if you don't put it out, yeah. it just goes to ash. You know, you don't sequester that carbon. So uh, yeah. I was really stoked on just, you know, that idea of adding the wedding agent to, um, to quenching, you know, the fire. That's gorgeous. Thank you for th thank you for that. I'm deaf because I learned I learned how to do biochar from you that that video you put out on Facebook the next day I was out there making biochar and I'm nice. like a fiend nice. at it now. So yeah, I'm making, yeah. So now even in this product now, I've, it's all my own biochar and it's hemp and nice. it's all the Great. sort of stems from last year's harvest, like ORAC. I do a lot with ORAC and, nice. um, and I've been um, putting out the fire using rice hull. So okay. I'll get a huge container of rice hull. So as I'm burning the fire and I'll start with the big pieces first, and then uh -huh. I go to the smaller and smaller, and I'll suffocate the fire as I go with the rice right. with the rice hull. Right. Okay. So it's literally made the biochar at the end is probably at least a third um, rice hull in addition to everything else. I see. So you're not quenching with water then? I am at the very very end, but I'm yeah. definitely quenching as I go, so I'm not having yeah. to do that major work at the end of putting it yeah. out. Yeah. Right. <laughs> like, right it does do the work of suffocation as it goes. So it's kind of cool. Yeah. Very yeah. cool. Yeah. 
Excellent. Yeah, yeah. I'll have to try that with the rice holes. Uh, it's cool. You know, that's rice hole biochar is some of the most ancient biochar. Um, I mean, I think different cultures across the globe are making biochar um, out of. Oops. Where'd you go? Is it me? That might be our end. How's it? Is everybody else still getting a uh, reception or did we lose Preston? We certainly got a lot of information in um, this session. I'm sure we're going to be talking to Preston again to, to share. And the sooner that we can get, yeah, he went, um, the sooner that we can get together as a working community actually doing the work of regeneration, the sooner that we can, uh, I believe we can restore our planet in a matter of, I used to think it was seven years with permaculture. I believe that we can, if we all do a concerted effort, we can do this in three years. And um, Preston, with his earlier part of this talk, talked about how he remediated his, his property that was basically caliche and hard clays in a matter of three months using a mixture of lab and um, uh, JMS. So I'm super excited uh, about the talk that we just had and, um, and I'm definitely going to be getting this live to you all on Facebook and Instagram. So if you missed anything, you can join. Um, would shavings work like the rice hulls? Sure. I mean, but the I like the rice hulls, especially for, well, for so many reasons. Um, it has the silica in it, but also just the shape of it is, I don't know, there's something just aesthetically beautiful. And I think aesthetics and function go hand in hand. Sometimes that little moon shape of, that it has, I think is just, it, it's good for aerating the soil and all kinds of things. Harry, he's coming back. Let's say good. Let's get him back. Happy midsummer from Sweden. I'll be rewatching. I'm so happy to see you here. Hi, Monica. Yay. Oh, Adam. <laughs> I'm sorry again. I was so sad to see you. I was like, oh. But I told everybody we're going to have to have another one of these conversations, though. Okay. Yeah, we will. Um, well, I mean, it's just signaling the the height of the solar day here. You know, us being on the yeah. um, the eve of the summer solstice. My phone I just I, my phone just turned off from heat temperature, so I think that's a sign. <laughs> Hilarious. So do you have any ceremonies planned for this evening, or any kind of special? Uh. Well, tomorrow just happens to be my birthday, and. Um, <gasps> <laughs> happy birthday thank you happy birthday to you i know you just had thank one you. i know we're, uh, you know what's we're funny i have to tell you something i have to tell you something <laughs> you know that you know that night we met in the alley when we were in boise yeah yeah are you gonna go this year by the way um you know i would like to i would like to yeah. you know it's it's possible to make it yeah. what is that october it's uh, august august end of august yeah possibly if i can okay. sneak away yeah i i would love That'd to cool. i would love to that's always such a good I'd like time to find, i'd like to find a way to see you again or visit anyway but like that so so that night um i did a poll downstairs in the in the basement of that dinner to yeah. find out how many gemini's were in the room and do you know of the soil stewards probably a good more than half of us are gemini's really wow isn't that weird like that is i think weird. gemini gemini's tend to to be natural farmers for some reason it seems to huh. suit us <laughs> yeah yeah interesting okay <laughs> anyway happy okay. birthday fellow gemini thank you. you too thank you you too and and happy uh happy solstice we're right on yeah. the, the eve and and um, and um fire ring eclipse too so yeah. that's that's really powerful as well um, um, so speaking of fire rings, somebody just asked about making biochar in a fire pit and mm -hmm. yeah, you can make biochar in a fire pit for sure. I make it. That's how in, I do it. Yeah. Likewise. Uh, you know, I've made it in little hibachis, you know, little, um, barbecue hibachis. I did a demonstration in Hawaii when I was there 
uh, and did it in a little hibachi. It was all I had, and we made biochar on a real small scale. Um, yeah. But that fire pit is essentially um, – I use really, like, archaic technology. I love, like, archaic technologies. And so, like, you know, I'll just dig a pit. And so this is, like, the Kontiki kiln, which essentially you can just dig a pit in the ground to do biochar. Um, and then the specific angle, you know, really works with the thermal dynamics in producing it, um, you know, in a very, um, in a method that's very efficient. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so and yeah, to answer that question, absolutely. You can, you can um, make biochar in a, in a fire pit. It's, it's, uh, it's really basic. It, it just comes down to pyrolysis, you know, you need a really hot core and then you want to reduce oxidation. So anytime you're seeing white ash is when you want to feed that fire fuel. So you need a really hot core and then you need to continuously feed that fire. Um, and like you were saying about the rice holes, almost put it out. So usually you start with, you know, bigger uh, fuel and then you, you reduce that, the smaller pieces and kind of almost suffocate it out. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that you're you're sequestering that carbon because if you're seeing smoke, you're not burning efficiently. You're you're releasing mm -hmm. carbon um, and those volatiles off. Yeah, and then yeah, not seeing get getting to that point where it's hot enough not to see smoke, and then every time you see ash is when I take basically a handful of char and I throw it right at that spot. And then if you're yeah. just like managing the white ash at that point, then you can really you can really control how much um, you, you can keep it a pretty efficient production of char. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. It's, it got kind of tricky on a, on a large scale when I was, you know, that burn I didn't bend where we had the four acres. I mean, literally we had 10 guys throwing, you know, hemp trees on that thing. And it was <laughs> like, talk about like feeding a dragon. That thing was insane. So, <laughs> um, yeah, it was, yeah, I mean, I, it, yeah, we could have been more efficient. There was definitely some oxidation. We were seeing like some some white ash, but you know, we we also at the end of that burn, we had uh, I think we got about four, you know, F one fifty truck beds of biochar from that burn. That's gorgeous. So we uh, we inoculated that, charged it with um, um, JMS, Jadon Microbial Solution, um, seawater and uh some humic acid uh before applying that out to the fields did you let that sit and did you did you uh do it to saturation basically yes yes definitely i'm i'm a big proponent of being patient with your biochar there's kind of some different information online uh about charging i think charging biochar is is, is one of the most overlooked things with biochar like there's a lot of biochar out there for sale and it is not all created equal um charging yeah. is like really crucial because if you don't charge your biochar you're essentially putting out a carbon sponge that's going to leach up any nutrients uh in your soil and that might take years for it to charge it's going to rob those nutrients from your plants so charging is absolutely crucial i think it's even some of these bigger companies that are using like fish hydrolysate, I don't think that's a good way to, to charge biochar. There yeah. was a pretty, I was privy to be part of a, a interesting conversation when I was in Hawaii and uh, you know, I was sitting with master Cho and, and this guy came to the workshop who was making all this FAA fish amino acids. And he was kind of using this method that was not, like the way Master Cho teaches it, you know, essentially what he was doing was filling buckets with fish and then actually adding some water in there and then capping it with sugar. So he wasn't equally using, you know, fish and sugar together. He was just yeah. capping it with sugar and had Ew. this. So he brought like a sample of this stuff and, yeah. uh, and it was super watered down. And it was just it was really funny because I'm sitting there with him. And Master Cho and Master Cho's granddaughter is translating for him. And uh, and so just the expression on his face when this guy showed his um, the the biochar <laughs> and uh, and his FA well the FAA uh, was super you know, watered down and Master Cho was just like, No, 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 like you need to 
layer this with sugar and um but then he was talking about charging it with his charging the biochar with the fa well the faa that he was creating and master cho was like no 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 you, you're not going to get like a good enough spectrum of microbes from using like fish emulsion or a fish product charging your biochar so yeah. this is where like imo really comes in because you have this like broader spectrum of of microbes you know and so i love adding biochar to to making uh imo3 piles i find that's that's a really good approach to Gorgeous. starting that process of, yeah. of charging but um yeah I'll, I'll generally let my biochar i like to make it in the burn months you know because right now like burn season's over it can't even burn right now yeah. you know it's really sensitive here in oregon california and um so I'll make it in those burn months and then I put it in barrels and I um, make my JMS, my um, IMOTs, liquid IMOTs and charge it uh, for two to three months. Mm -hmm. I think it's necessary to charge biochar. Yes. Um, I'm not nice. somebody who thinks you can just like charge biochar in a week. And there yeah. is some information out there, you know, saying stuff like that. So I think it takes so time. Yeah. So I was listening to some of uh, Master Cho's um, lectures and there was, I kind of pulled a, a soil recipe and he was, he mentioned that he was um, treating the biochar with vinegar and, you know, biochar is naturally al alkaline. Right. Do you ever do any, and I kind of figured out what it would take to get it to about a 6.8 or something was about an ounce of vinegar to saturated char so that's kind of what i do okay yeah i do that even before i uh charge it are you finding that mm. the alkalinity are you do you have any insight into that well one one thing to add is one of the byproducts of making biochar is what's called wood vinegar which is being used it has some really interesting uh some research is being done in it has a history of being used uh, in Japan and elsewhere. There you go again. <laughs> I guess there's a saturation point for uh, shared knowledge. <laughs> okay. We should have taken that opportunity to say goodbye. <laughs> This is going to be fun. This could be fun. Can talk about. So um, there was a question about talking about fermented seawater on the coast. So I'm not able to utilize real seawater. So I end up using um, sea salt a lot. And my fermentations. Hey, you're you're welcome. It's really nice to see you all here. And. Um, so yeah, I'm my fermented seawater takes the form of just adding, you know, uh, following the recipe that I have um, and leaving it for 24 hours. But I'm sure that um, Preston would have something different to say about fermented seawater. So we'll get some information. Well, at the next conversation, I'll put a mark. I'll put a, a note in to to talk about, um, or some of you coast dwellers will talk about seawater. Chris might have some insight to that too as well. So we'll get some information out. Um, it's been really fun, you guys. I'm I'm really enjoying these Friday sessions, and uh, get in touch with me if there's anything you want to know about, or if anybody wants to come on and talk about their experiences, or you know, I just feel like this is an oh, this should be a platform for us to have conversations and really have conversations about the things that are really beginning to matter in our world. Like I'm just coming into this awareness of what's actually happening with, with uh, pl the plant's immune function and our relationship with this, with the micro microbial world, including the anaerobics um, right as the coronavirus is coming into our awareness. And I just, there's just such a disconnect between what's really happening in our world and how we're, it's being interpreted for us as far as policy and uh, 
and, and trying to isolate us. So I feel like these platforms are really important because we need to be able to come together and talk openly and uh, free source about these things. So we're gonna go live one more time and we're gonna say probably give it, let this be an opportunity to say goodbye and we will see you again soon probably. <laughs> We're connecting back. Hi again. <laughs> Hello. I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, I'm, hey, it's the way it is. I'm sitting in the shade now because I keep getting temperature. Like my phone keeps dying from temperature. It's getting so hot. Wow. Well, I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule and mm. doing what you're doing to, to share so much information, Preston. I'm happy to. Thank you for having me here. Yeah. yeah pleasure. For sure. I love I love the open source community in natural farming and, uh, you know, permaculture and, and really herbalism, too. So, um, yes. yeah, I think that's it's a really beautiful thing to to have people share their experience and and, uh, you know, support. And uh, I just want to continue, you know, doing so in, in that in this beautiful community that we all are in. Yeah. And somebody did ask about seawater. Do you fermented seawater? Do you have any insights to share real quick before we say goodbye on that one or Um well, yeah, I have been doing fermented seawater and I love it. Um yeah. I did get these like blooms of like purple uh bacteria from from my seawater, so um oh. I think I am getting some you know, um photobacteria in my seawater. So that's really exciting. Um, yeah. So, anyways, the the the, wa the seawater that I'm adding to my um, my feeds is fermented seawater, and and I love it. I I think it just micronizes everything down. You get a nice um, array of some some just another layer of of microbes, you know, from the sea. So you're adding more diversity from. Mm -hmm that biology from the ocean, mixing that with like your IMOs and your facultative anaerobes um, mm, and yeah. just creating more diversity, which is the name of the game for me, right? That's name that's, of the how, game. Na that's how nature works. You know, <laughs> diversity, diversity is king. Yeah. You know, there, there is, if we have time, there's- Oh, maybe... we have so much time, you go. Okay. So I guess like I was earlier, I was talking about um, kind of jumping all over the place. I apologize, like but earlier- um, I was talking about like mixing Jadam and KNF. And so the major differences in the approach of the two is that with Korean natural farming, you are actually relying on the resilience of your soil, building your soil um, and the immunity of your plants. So um, it's preventative measures. Whereas Jadam, you have this whole arsenal of, uh, pesticides to use and Jadam has a protocol where you you know on a regular basis you are applying the the pesticides whether or not you're seeing any problems you you are you're always applying the pesticide uh in intervals and so um if you're mixing Jadam and knf together you can't really be spraying for me it's still a matter of preventative measures and i'm only spraying you know bay laurel and, and other um pesticides only when i have problems because if you take a jadam approach to knf there is a clash in where those regular pesticide applications are going to affect those uh the beneficial biology that you're building in korean natural farming this is something i had a direct talk to young Sancho from Jadam about and so I was at, I was asking him about the connection of the two Korean natural mm -hmm. farming and Jadam and, and so that was a concern that he mentioned was that the the application say sulfur things like some of those um uh you know different pesticides that you can make in Jadam can have an adverse effect like on your beneficial biology so um so my approach mixing the two Oh, we're geez. so resilient we just keep coming back i i need to learn about this i i have yet to be i haven't even read the jadam book yet so i'm fascinated by what you're talking about i have so much to learn yeah. from you um so let's go just back to that real quick because i yeah i got uh, cut off right when i was trying to make a point about yeah uh, about using the two so really um 
you can't take like if you're doing Korean natural farming with IMO and lactic acid bacteria and all these beneficials, um, a regular application of like sulfur or even something like bay can really have an adverse effect on on that. So, um, anyways, I'll only use that for preventative measures, uh, and I'm not Perfect. doing a regular spray. Perfect. The way, Perfect. The, because Jadam does uh, the protocol for Jadam is you're spraying some of these pesticides, whether you're seeing any problems or not, that's kind of the difference there. So what did he have to say when you were talking? So was he supportive of this kind of uh, hybrid approach um, using Jadam and um, Korean natural farming? Uh, when you had that conversation, was that a supported? Yeah, you know, there's kind of been rumors flying for a while and, you know, Jason Riesling, talking to him about this but the the you know um cho han Kyu and cho young sun like combining their their practices into into one mm -hmm. um i don't know if that'll ever happen or not but because the father took a different approach and and so has the son and he's kind of off yeah. on his, you know and master cho says that jadam is the future um now so uh i did get some positive feedback when i talked to cho young son about um mixing the two but that that was the biggest um concern that he had was that you know using using the imo and lactic acid bacteria um along with some of these pesticides you know those pesticides can have an adverse effect on that so that was the biggest concern that he brought up with okay. that but but yeah he he did seem to think like um you know i use jadal microbial solution in tandem with with imo and i have a protocol of how i do that i'll, I'll apply jadal microbial solution which is more of a facultative um slightly more anaerobic and i'll use that for that deeper soil um horizon you know, where there's no oxygen and, and that really helps to break up hard soils, clay, rock. Whereas um, then I'll come back, you know, with, with IMO and apply that just for the topsoil. You know, yeah, right and I'm, I'm the kind of the same way because I've got hard clays too. And I'm finding, are you finding this to be true? Like once I started bringing in the facultatives through the, it seemed to support the fungal growth from uh, the more aerobic. Like they seem to be, it seemed to give this kind of foundational support and I got much like more vigorous growth from um, the fungi that I was getting from my, my IMO piles than before. So I feel like there's some function that's allowing them to be extremely uh, cooperative. I, yeah, definitely. I agree. And I'm seeing similar results, you know, oh, using cool. the, of the JMS, it could, could have to do with, you know, the JMS going in, doing the job first of breaking apart clay, you know, micronizing down some of that into available minerals. And then the IMOs yeah. are feeding on that. I um, think so. Yeah. So I, you know, and this to me is just it. It's, it shouldn't be this battle of, um, you know, aerobic versus anaerobic. And, you know, they're, they're both necessary in nature. There's no discrimination between the two. They both have roles within nature. So within yeah. the farm, within our gardens, they both have a role as well. Yeah, I so agree. And finding so that agree. balance is, is the, is the tricky part, but, um, yeah. but it's doable. Yeah, for yeah. sure. I that's, think, that's beautiful. Yeah. And I also feel like some way, like there's, I can't believe how much food this provides for for like let's say earthworms and earthworms eat fungi like left on their own they're going to eat all the fungal growth that you have so maybe also a function of this um this breakdown of our clays into food are actually just like we're starving and our world is starving through this kind of you know disruption that maybe the facultatives are giving these um, insects, the food that they need to kind of let the fungi do what they need to do. Maybe it's even just as simple as that. Yeah, like, could be. Just, we need to re micro re mineralize, you know, not only ourselves, but our, right. our insect world as well.
Right. Yeah, and you're working with the clay is doing doing a lot of that, so that's great. Yeah, Very so cool. how fun, man. Anyway, so let's take this opportunity, I guess, even though I don't want to say goodbye. <laughs> I know. I'd love to talk all day, but, yeah, I, I, it was tough for me even to get away. I got to go help put in some drip line on our, yeah. on our farm. So, yeah. Um, but, well, I appreciate um, the time you took. Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate you having me on and sharing. And, um, you know, just want to say much love to everybody out there, the natural farming community. And, um, <laughs> you know, happy solstice to everybody. Happy summertime. Yeah, yeah. And get out there and do something, guys. Just make sure whatever it is, take this information. And, and if you've learned something new, apply it. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> and um, remember to be um, reverent and respectful with your with your wild crafting. Beautiful message. Thank you, Preston. Thank you, Peace Tina. There. Peace. See you. Bye. <laughs> All right, everybody. Um, thanks for joining. And um, We'll make sure that this gets shared on all platforms. And uh, please do go on. I've got my store listed online. Go and purchase some balls. They're only six, piece, six bucks a piece. Um, this is going to be offered soon. I've got Bokashi now.